Well, let's uh, let's jump right into it because I am very excited to learn about what you do. Mm-hmm. I- I'll be honest, when I was like writing questions, preparing for this interview. I I had to keep going back because I realized that like half of the things that I was talking about were just dumb stereotypes that I saw from like 90s sex comedies and and honestly like the butt of the joke in a lot of ways. So rather than just debunking all of that, I, I want to get your elevator pitch. I mean, what does it mean in 2022 to be a professional dominatrix? Yeah, um... You know, it means helping people explore themselves. Um, yeah, I was actually talking about this yesterday. You know, a lot of people don't find work fulfilling. Mm. Um, but I personally find my work incredibly fulfilling, you know, when clients laugh or cry during a session or, you know, at the end, they're like, I can't believe this. You know, you've opened my eyes and my world. You know, you've made me feel so great. I'm on cloud nine, et cetera. Um, and it's just teaching people and giving them that experience and especially in a safe and educated way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fair to say because there are a lot of potential risks and dangers and it's kind of nice having a professional walk you through some of that. Yeah, exactly. You know, professionals, we practice years, you know, before we offer things to clients, you Mm. know, if you take safety uh, seriously, at least. Um, You know, I had a client recently who was very interested in sounding and I was guiding him I told him you need to get these types of sounds let me know when they arrive and then I will guide you explicitly on how to do this Mm -hmm. and he took it upon himself to just do it on his own Um, and it led to an infection Mm -hmm. and he's still feeling it um, a month later and so you know You also get the peace of mind that the person, the dom that you're sessioning with knows what they're doing Mm -hmm. and is going to keep you safe and keep you healthy. Yeah. Okay. So there's a, there's a big education piece, but what, what does your day to day look like? Day to day, lots of emails. <laughs> sure, <laughs> responding yeah. to a lot of emails. But people forget about the business <laughs> of sex. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> There's so many emails. Um, I've fallen off the bandwagon with social media. Just. T- kind of can't care about it right now. Yeah, I mean, so with all stressful. the deplatforming of sex workers exactly. and everything else, I mean, it sounds exhausting being just shadow banned constantly. Exactly. So my day, emails, um, I'm on Sext Panther, so I'm texting with clients, doing video chats, um, and then sessioning as my books permit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So do you consider what you do sex work? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I consider camming, stripping, escorting, being a dominatrix, content creator, anything that's sexual in nature is definitely sex work. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, especially once it crosses into the realm of you're getting financial deposits from adult businesses, um, definitely you cross (laughs) that, sorry, you cross that uh, line into sex work. Yeah, fair to say. Uh, Well, then, if it counts as sex work, help us out with some terminology here. I mean, dom, dom with an E, (laughs) domina, domina, dominatrix, escort, sugar baby, hooker. I mean, can can you walk us through some of the distinctions and and maybe help us identify any any slurs or or language you should maybe be aware of? Yeah, so I think, you know... Lexicon changes. Um, Now, hooker, you know, is not seen as politically correct. Um, Prostitute, you know, is not so kind anymore. Sure. Um, You can say it, uh, but Taylor Tomlinson did a great joke. You know, you can call someone a prostitute. You're technically right, but you're a jerk. Yeah, sure. Yeah. (laughs) So it's kind of like that. Um, So the proper term is escort, you know, um, you're providing your time, whatever happens. Mm -hmm. Um, Then Dom... And dom slash Emmy, you know, that's just male dominant or female dominant. Um, Sugar babies. (laughs) I love sugar babies. (laughs) (laughs) Um, They um, they have, you know, kind of like pseudo relationships Mm -hmm. um, with clients. It's all transactional. It's absolutely phenomenal. And uh, were there any others? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that that covers it by and large. Uh, I, I believe you introduced yourself as a dominatrix. Is yes. there is there significance to that label for you? Uh, yes. So for me, I consider myself a dominatrix, and I view that as a professional term, mm-hmm. um, as well as mistress and domina. 
um, there is a professional connotation and weight with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So prostitution is illegal in Texas, but what does that actually mean? Like how, how is that line drawn and, and does it impact your work at all? Uh, yeah, it uh, impacted my work like almost immediately. Um, so for the longest time, it was just a misdemeanor. But mm. as of September 2021, um, they made it a felony um, to buy or provide sex. Um, now it's first time too. So before, you know, you could get a warning, and then the second time, you know, you'd be a felon. Now it's just straight up you're a felon. Um, So a lot of clients, you know, have gotten very cautious, you know, because you want to try to avoid a felony (laughs) on your record, you know, so it's very scary for them to reach out to someone and have that trust, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's hard to navigate that. And, uh, you know, we have the you can't have six plus dildos. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are laws boat. like that on the books, and that's why I, I kind of wonder, like, yeah. how are these things being enforced? What does it actually look like on, yeah. on the ground? It's kind of more of like a gotcha, you mm. know? So when it comes down to law enforcement, they usually try and do, uh, you know, something that's worth their time. So they'll book, you know, multiple doms at a time. Um, and look around the room, you know, so if they see those six dildos <laughs> there, that's a gotcha, you know, if they see, hey, there's more than one dominatrix profiting off of this, that's technically considered a brothel. Mm-hmm. And so that's a felony as well. So they have all of these laws in place, essentially, like, to get you should they pass your screening, if you even have any. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so then what are some of the things that you are able to offer? I mean, what does a a session with you potentially look like? Sure. So I specialize in ball busting and in medical play. Mm. Um, So with ball busting, uh, that's kicking, punching, squeezing, just going to town, (laughs) really, and brutalizing people's testicles. Um, It is just so much fun for me. (laughs) It, It just brings me pure joy and smiles across my face, and they just love it. Um, and then with medical play, I just, it's kind of flipping the script for me. Like I have a lot of medical issues and so it's really nice to play doctor and be in control. Um, I really love electro play. I love sounding and catheters, needles, just anything medical and really invasive. (laughs) Yeah, and and all stuff that I should really point out. uh, If you are listening to this with any amount of like anxiety or (laughs) tension, you would probably want somebody who actually knows what they're doing with some of this stuff. I mean, ball busting is, yes, painful, but but can be safe, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, you don't want to cause any permanent damage. You know, I have had clients who are like, I want you to bust me until I'm castrated and I'm like that's a great fantasy but it's not going to happen (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) we'll role play it but it's just not going to happen yeah so uh walk me through what a session might look like I mean how how does it start how long does it last I I know we're talking in a lot of abstractions but uh, what help us understand a little bit about what hiring someone like you might entail Sure. So I guess from the client side, you know, they have to come across me, uh, submit the application on my website, go through screening, um, pay deposit. And then once they arrive, um, it's very casual at first. You know, I don't put on like the Dom hat until time starts. Mm. So it's very casual, you know, welcome them, check in on them, see if they need anything. Um, And if they're good, you know, just have them undressed and we just start. Um, I'm very creative and sure. I don't like to plan sessions. I know some mm. people really like, like they'll make a checklist script out and script out what and... they want to do. Yeah. And someone, when I first started, suggested that to me. So I tried it out and I found myself like blanking. I was sure. like, I yeah. don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, and I've just found that just being creative, just right on the spot is what works out best for me and my clients too. So I guess 
there's just really no way to say, you know, <laughs> on average, my clients book like two to four hours. Mm, okay. Um, you want to have enough time to really delve into it. Mm -hmm. um, with one hours, it's really hard to get into the psychology and really, really have fun. Um, a good 90 minutes helps with that, at least from like the professional dominatrix side. Um, it's weird, but that extra 30 minutes makes a huge difference. I recognize that. Because you have that. The, the ramp up, the play, and then like the slow down. So it's nice when you have a little bit of extra time. Yeah, so are, are you billing by the hour then? By the service? By, by the orgasm? I mean, how, how does that look? <laughs> so me personally, by the hour, um, I charge extra for Roman showers, which is vomiting on people. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. Fair enough. Uh, where, where do sessions take place? I mean, do you, do you rent a studio? What, what does that look like? Uh, I cannot discuss that. Fair to say, <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you do, what, what does a typical work week look like? I mean, a lot of admin stuff, but yeah. then how, how many sessions can you actually enjoy and what, what feels like full-time work for you? Yeah, so I put a lot of effort <laughs> and time and energy into my sessions. I can really only do like one session a day. Mm. Um, a lot of people can really knock them out. Um, I don't know if it's some anxiety or my epilepsy or something, but I can only like truly give myself to like one session a day. And be like truly present, exactly, really enjoying that and process. Exactly, yeah. and give them my best self. Um, and then I usually try and take at least two to three days off per week. I'm relatively low volume on purpose. Mm -hmm. Especially with how things are going, <laughs> you have to pick the right clients. Yeah, no, that, that's fair to say. I mean, uh, with COVID and with the, I don't know, this bizarre relationship that our country is having with prostitution writ large, it, fe it feels at times like we're moving towards some sort of decriminalization, legalization. And then at other times there's this huge snapback. I, I mean, you don't have to walk us through all the geopolitics of it, but what has your business model looked like over the past years? Has, has that shifted much? Yeah, I would say it's actually been a roller coaster. Sure. Um, you know, I've been playing just personally since I was in college, and I professionally got into it around 2017. Mm -hmm. um, got into social media, and back then, like, shadow banning was not a thing. Um, cash apps and banking were not looking at adult deposits mm. under a microscope. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where it started, actually. Um, a lot of uh, banks, thanks to Visa and MasterCard, started cracking mm -hmm. down. Um, and then websites followed, and then FOSTA SESTA happened. And once that happened, advertising completely changed yeah absolutely um that's when shadow banning really took place because platforms were scared well we don't want to be held liable mm -hmm. for xyz's posts you know um and so your visibility completely tanked and so for example at the time if you didn't have clientele you had to struggle so hard to even be seen mm. um so yeah, it's it's just been a roller coaster because it seems like you said like you finally get things going, you adjust to it, and then bam, they just throw something else at us, whether it be legislative or financial. Yeah, I, I don't want to put uh, put you too much on the spot, but like I, I think for a lot of folks, it's yay, OnlyFans reverse its decision. <laughs> Are you feeling hopeful? Are you feeling like there's a, a trend line here that things may be getting better at some point in the future, or is it just all downhill? It, it is all downhill from sure. here. It is all downhill from here. Unfortunately, um, it's only getting worse. Um, I also know some people in cybersecurity, and they tell me things that are happening, and it's bad, and it's just going to get worse. Um, so, I mean, all we can do is just take it day by day. Sure. Um, sex work is the oldest profession. You know, we roll with the punches, and we have to adapt. 
And that's just really what it boils down to, even if it's incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I think that's, again, another reason why a professional can be so valuable, because there is this incredible community of folks. I mean, I, I definitely don't want to speak for you or speak for that community, but from the outside, I am amazed at the way that uh, folks have organized to to try and you know support one another and have some kind of voice in this process. I think it depends on the city you live in. Sure. That's all I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> well, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Uh, well, yeah. So with regards to clients, uh, do you do you have a lot of repeat customers? I mean, do you form something of a, of a relationship with folks? How, how does that evolve? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would say most of my clients are repeat clients, actually. Um, and each relationship is totally different. You know, with my repeat clients, it could just be they just come in all the time and we just have fun and that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, then there are some clients who are like, no, I only want to serve one dom. I want you to be the dom and they want to build an emotional connection. And it's emotional in the dom sub you know, not romantic, like we're going to fall in love type situation. Sure. Um, and those are usually the clients who really go above and beyond, you know, like they'll bring me flowers or they'll tip me. I have one client who always brings me vegan chocolates because <laughs> he knows I have the biggest sweet tooth. Um, so I'll like just eat chocolates throughout the session. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're honestly great. Yeah, yeah. How do you manage those relationships? Uh, you you talked about you know in a dom sub way, but not in a romantic way. Mm-hmm. What do those boundaries feel like for you? Uh, well, they feel great. Um, it's something that I have it explicitly listed on my website as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I go over it at the beginning of the session before we start. You know, I say you cannot touch me, <laughs> period, without my consent. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've never had a single problem. Um, I have had two clients fall in love with me. I, yeah, they get really too into the fantasy. And there is, sure. like, when you play and there is chemistry with someone, it's easy to, like, get wrapped up in your romanticize feelings. Romanticize that. Yeah, yeah they I romanticize guess it. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Especially, you know, one client, they're their wife you know was not kinky at all so you know it was like oh my god she's this dominant goddess who's kinky too and you know and it's hard to you know kind of like break their hearts sometimes but you have to draw the line at least for me personally like this is purely professional Mm -hmm. like i'm not here to be in a relationship with you yeah No, I I get that. Uh, I, you know, as a therapist, I am also in a number of commodified relationships. Mm -hmm. And there is that question of, well, you know, do you even like me or are you just here for the money? And I I think what folks might not recognize is that, yes, there is a relationship. There is care. There is concern. But you can also, you know, create some lines here around, like, what that relationship can and cannot entail uh, do you have any any tips for just how to, I guess, hold some of those lines? I think you really just have to have the confidence in saying no. Sure. And I think that's the hardest thing. Like, people have a hard time saying no and then consistently saying no. Mm-hmm. And then it's also really hard because, you know, some people are like master manipulators, so they will try very sneakily to do things. Sure. And you just kind of, you know, you have to be self-aware of what's going on and be able to put your foot down and say, hey, this is not happening. Mm-hmm. You either shape up or we're done. Yeah, fair to say.